Hello, this is Kao Kandek with Mokana, and welcome to our webinar today on uh, IoT security best practices, migrating away from open source security. Today we're going to be covering a, uh, uh, a topic called Understanding Compliance and Support Costs. And uh, as for those of you who attended uh, our first part in this series, about understanding the risks and vulnerabilities. This is the second part. And again, we're going to focus on compliance and support with respect to open source security software. Um, and, uh, and, and later, we'll, be, we'll have one more uh, part in this series on how to migrate safely off of open source and SSL libraries. So let's get started. As, uh, as usual, if you have any questions, please do submit them through chat and we'd be happy to answer them. Today we're joined by Dean Weber, our CTO, and uh, Dean has uh, uh, been with CSC, was the CTO at CSC Global Cybersecurity and uh, was previously the CTO at Applied Identity, which is acquired by Citrix. He spent uh, a good amount of time at various security companies, is a frequent speaker at many different conferences, and, uh, and spent part of his career working at the U in the U.S. Navy in physical and electronic security. Um, thanks for joining us, Dean. Thanks for having me. All right. So today we're going to be talking about uh, compliance and support. Uh, for those of you that, that missed the last webinar, just to kind of catch you up, what we discussed was the risks around using open source security for, uh, for your applications, for embedded systems, for IoT, for industrial control systems. So this is specifically about how to think about what, what risks there are in using various distributions that are out there. Now, more than half of companies leverage open source software for production. And uh, when we look at some of the risks that are out there, you know, part of it has to do just with the, the large code base of, uh, especially in things with uh, uh, software such as OpenSSL, uh, the vulnerabilities that emerge and the time it takes to actually remedy those vulnerabilities, to patch them. Uh, OpenSSL, for example, has nearly half a million lines of code. It's complex. Uh, there are no real coding guidelines. And, um, and especially now, from a compliance standpoint, it's being challenged to meet various uh, evolving standards, such as FIPS. And the vulnerabilities are fairly high, you know, up to three a month uh, in, uh, in some years with OpenSSL. Uh, so imagine that, you know, every, every, uh, every month there's, there are three patches that you need to deal with. And according to OpenSSL, it takes about 40 days to, uh, from when a vulnerability is identified to actually uh, addressing it and responding to it, which typically means publishing a patch, at which point uh, then the end users need to go out and patch it in all of their systems. Uh, so I know, um, you know, one of the one of the the more well known uh, uh, vulnerabilities was Heartbleed, and uh, Dean, I wanted to have you talk a little bit about. Heartbleed and what went on, and also how it impacted kind of the uh, architecture and, and compliance uh, for the open SSL uh, uh, organization and software. Well, I mean, so I think it, if you're not familiar with Heartbleeds, it's not not hard to figure out what went on there. The biggest problem with Heartbleed was that the way that the um, the exploit was was built. Um, was actually in a way that was not logged. So we didn't know whether the exploit was actually leveraged or not. We just had to fix it as quickly as we could as an industry. 
And, you know, there were a lot of different uh, attempts to fix it in terms of, you know, host-based intrusion detection and prevention. There were um, antivirus uh, update files available through most of the major carriers or most of the major uh, providers. And, you know, it, it took a long time to physically get out and actually update the code to a code base that was not impacted by heart bleeds. So, you know, in, in, the, in the broad scheme of things, there was a, an easily exploitable vulnerability that had been around for years. We had absolutely no idea whether or not the exploit was actually leveraged because we had no ability to determine whether the vulnerability was exercised. And that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And, you know, when they went through and had to, to uh, patch it, of course, that, you know, impacted... Um, uh, number of systems out there, servers, uh, websites, um, as well as a number of embedded systems, industrial control systems. Now, there was an, also an aspect to this of, uh, with those changes, needing to recertify, uh, and then, and then uh, FIPS, maybe you could talk a little bit about FIPS, um, how that has also changed and just the impact of what needed to change with open source security? Sure. So, I mean, in, 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 in the broad landscape, um, several prior versions to re current release at that time were vulnerable to the exploit going back, as I said, two and a half years, which was probably seven or eight releases um, of OpenSSL. And again, organizations aren't well positioned to do broad-scale updates of their OpenSSL libraries. Um, so the, uh, I think it was 1.0.2 was the current release for the fix for heart bleeds, and it actually turned out to not be 100% fix. There was subsequent releases, but they, that was not a version that had a certified FIPS library associated with it, so they had to hurry up and get that version certified. So basically organizations that were uh, reliant on FIPS certification as a meet requirements standard um, we're kind of stuck in the middle between either running uncertified code in FIPS mode or in running vulnerable code in older models that were FIPS certified. So it was a, kind of a catch-22 for a while until the industry could get caught up with uh, the problems. And then again, it was a wholesale update of the SSL library itself uh, in order to be able to solve for the problem that was the heartbeat bug. Tell me about... Can you can you explain uh, what FIPS is for those of for those out there that may not be familiar with uh, with FIPS? Sure, absolutely. Um, so you know, FIPS is a federal information processing standard. It was a, a mechanism that the United States government put into place um, decades ago now um, around the ability of the government to validate that cryptographic functions were doing the things they were supposed to be doing and no others. Um, in days of past, you know, the libraries were, were bifurcated where you could run cipher suites in the non-FIPS model, but if you ran the FIPS model, you had to run the cipher suites that were FIPS certified on a FIPS certified cryptographic engine. Um, over time, that became something that the government did for itself uh, as a part of FISMA, and then as FISMA became more and more standardized across all of the U.S. government initiatives, um, it became pretty evident that if you wanted to communicate with the United States government using a, an SSL tunneling technique, you had to use a FIPS certified browser, you had to use other FIPS certified cryptographic libraries and cipher suites. So it became a de facto industry standard on a global basis um, to use the FIPS certification. The other big thing about FIPS certification, it is a rather stringent benchmark that is overseen by the United States government testing facilities. It's done by commercial labs, but with uh, review by the government, um, NIST specifically. And what that does is that provides a mechanism by which um, all softwares associated with this can be held to a single standard. So things like side channel attacks, you know, in, in, in our case at Mocano, when, when we are using FIP certified libraries, you know, it's, it's probably the most single stringent validation of our code that, that we can publish in terms of how do we test our code to be, 
to be known good and free of defect at point in time. Does that answer the question? Great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, staying on this compliance area, uh, there are a whole host of standards <laughs> that are out there and, and, um, and best practices. Um, you know, there are a number uh, of standards bodies. There are also a number of industry-specific associations. Um, can you talk a bit about some of the more important ones that, uh, that people, uh, you know, whether you're a device designer, a, a consultant, a manufacturer, a software, security software engineer, you know, which, which of these are the ones to pay attention to and uh, just uh, kind of give us a, an overview of some of these. Sure. Well, it really depends on the industry you're in as to what, what specific focus you're going to have. So if you're in, in general industrial, um, most of the U.S. Uh, guidance coming out of NIST and coming out of DHS is around 853R4, soon to be R5, um, which is the NIST compliance standards for FISMA. Um, there's guidance coming out from DHS that says expect that we're going to, in the future, uh, start looking at uh, private industries' uh, compliance with that style framework. It may not be at the at the same validation level, but it's going to be that style of framework. Outside of the United States, there's a there's an IEC standard called 62443, and the specific area around cyber that is um, of value to this conversation is is three dash three which is the cybersecurity standards of the platforms and devices themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. But then if you get out into, you know, the specific industry stuff, whether that's electrical and nuclear for NERC-SIP, uh, which is a public-private partnership between the government, U.S. government and uh, private industry to say these are the standards by which we're going to hold ourselves, these are the standards that we're going to be able to convey as artifacts, um, so that's a, that's a value proposition in a public-private partnership that we've agreed on between industry and government as appropriate for that industry. There are other compliance elements in other aspects of industry, uh, specifically around the chemical uh, manufacturing. CFATS is a chemical facilities um, anti-terrorism, uh, what the AS is for, but I mean it's, it's basically a compliance framework for chemical industries, people that have, that make things that can blow up um, into a framework that the government can accept as appropriate for that industry. Same way with things like DO-178, which is the FAA standard for um, aviation flight systems and avionics, where it's a system level certification that takes into consideration all of the various components of an avionics platform, which may mean everything from uh, cockpit controls to infotainment systems in the passenger compartments, et cetera, et cetera. So it really depends on the industry that you're in. But I would say, to answer your question <laughs> in a shorter format, the two would probably be NIST and, and 62443 are the general guidances for industry. Yeah. And those, those in themselves can even be a bit Byzantine uh, in terms of that. I mean, even just diving into, uh, we'll come back to this one, into I, uh, IEC 62443, you talked about 3-3, which is really where a lot of these systems and system requirements, security assurance levels fit in. But there are a whole variety of other uh, um, aspects to the IEC standard that need to be followed. Um, yeah. Um, so kind of diving into, you know, these standards with respect to open source in particular and how companies should think about what is, yeah, how, how open source kind of relates to ch either challenges or ease of compliance. Sure. Um. So in general, over the years, the, the OpenSSL Foundation as the leader uh, participant in the certification process supported by the Linux Foundation have generated platforms that have been uh, release candidates for FIPS certification. And the 
foundations themselves uh, go out to industry and acquire funding to help them take these types of standards through certification. Um, well, over time, they have struggled more and more with those types of certifications and getting people to funding, um, getting people to fund them, I should say. <clears throat> so, you know, we're in a situation right now where we're we're kind of in a <laughs> in a unique situation where um, the current release of OpenSSL um, that is GA'd is 1.0.9, and its FIPS certification and its support license from the OpenSSL Foundation both expire in December of 2019. The replacement for 1.0.9, 1.1.0, has been determined to not be a release candidate for FIPS for various reasons that we don't need to get into here. So the next release candidate that is likely to be valid for FIPS consideration will be 1.1.1 that is currently in a beta release. So a, a number of things coming together here. One is they, they really don't have a good funding source for getting 1.1.1 through the FIPS process. Um, they've lost some industry participants and contributors on the FIPS side to get that accomplished. There's still some left, but you know, they have struggled with the, the funding mechanism to get it through certification. They've struggled with the participation, and that's compounded now by the fact that OpenSSL is moving away from the GPL license and moving into the Apache Foundation license, which means that in the past, the GPL license has required anybody, whether it's private label or direct, uh, anybody that's made changes to the source code of OpenSSL has had to contribute those back to the community. When they get to the Apache Foundation, that's no longer the case. So what you're going to see is the potential for a lot more code branches, which is going to exacerbate the problem of getting a single standard FIPS certified. And then last but not least is, do they have enough time to actually get through the release candidate program, to get all of the major bugs fixed, to assemble a compliance package, to get that submitted and reviewed all in time, um, sometime before December of 2019, with sufficient um, lead time to actually make things, uh, release candidates actually be able to be involved in upgrade paths for all of the existing OpenSSL FIPS certified libraries. So it's a it's, uh, it, it's wow. going to be a stretch for them. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Whew, I know. I was thinking, what? Um, <laughs> say what? So, I mean, so this seems pretty major. This is pretty recent, right, this Apache direction? Well, it's, it's been in discussion for a long time, but they actually released the press release, I think, uh, on Monday regarding the, uh, the, 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 the primary decision to move the Apache Foundation off of GPL. Right. So it feels a bit like... You know, um, you know the the foundation has and the community has, has struggled a bit to make these big changes to the overall code base uh, to evolve. So now they're going to move it into an Apache license, which now everyone will kind of be on their own, where the community will uh, play. You know, it's unclear actually to me if it moves to Apache, what what real consolidating role the community will be able to provide because people will be able to branch out in all sorts of different ways with, it, with an Apache license. Yeah, absolutely. So, the, I mean, the assumption is is that the foundation will support a release candidate for FIPS consideration and that that will then be, you know, funded and taken through the FIPS certification process and then that will be the lock code base, kind of like we were back in the 097, 098 days where if you wanted to run a FIPS library, you had to lock out the Cypher suites that were not FIPS compliant. They, they couldn't even be present on the machine. And in order to do that, you actually had to create a code branch, a compile time code branch. So in the, in the longer term of things, I think we'll see that um, I don't think FIPS is going to take a back seat, but it's just going to be um, more difficult to determine what is FIPS compliant and what isn't. Uh, unless we create multiple code branches, and multiple code branches are going to cause <laughs> consternation in, in terms of am I running the right code branch in order to achieve my compliance requirements. Sounds like for those that are using OpenSSL today who need to remain compliant, watch out for December 9, 2019, because the old stuff 
won't be compliant. Uh, um, yeah, and it's a double and, whammy, right? It's not just yeah. the, the support for the code that's going away. It's actually the actual FIP certification sunsets as well. Mm, right. And then if you're trying to remain compliant, um, you may need to do more of that on your own it, it, with your own development or kind of it's, a, it's still kind of a wait and see, I would say. Absolutely. And we didn't actually discuss that branch, which is you can take the code base and submit on your own behalf, right? You, you don't have to use, I mean, the, the value proposition of using the foundation's SSL libraries that are FIP certified are, are evident, right? You don't have to do it yourself. But there's nothing to prevent you from assembling a, a package and, and presenting it for certification on your own as an organization. It's just expensive. It's time consuming. It's harder to do with open source because of the various contributors to the open source model all have to be uh, part and parcel of the of the basis for submittal. They don't necessarily become involved in the actual certification process, but they do have to be named in terms of the developers. I mean, it's one of the things they're running into problems on right now, which is trying to find all of the original code contributors so that the GPL license can be uh, extracted and turned into an Apache Foundation license model. Right. And, and I think, you know, the way the industry is going with regard to security, it's just more complex, right? These older SSL libraries are, are not, I mean, you know, they aren't, they aren't everything that you need. You certainly need more than an SSL library. You need to figure out authentication. You need to figure out trust chaining. You have to integrate uh, perhaps hardware-based secure elements. Um, so, uh, and I wait, think, then there's yeah. quantum. <laughs> and quantum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so, I know it can be confusing, compliance. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the Industrial Internet Consortium is doing and other models to kind of, you know, try to simplify some compliance and, and broaden it? from these SSL libraries to, you know, things that are more, um, that are more applicable to, re to uh, comprehensive security. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in general, the IIC is an organization of manufacturers. Um, mm -hmm. It's the companies, them, I mean, it's kind of like the NERC and FERC partnership, not really, but you can use that as a simile, where the organizations, the, the manufacturers are coming together to say, let's standardize on, on some of the output aspects of what we're doing in terms of uh, artifacts, in terms of claims, and you know, mm -hmm. so that we're not recreating the wheel each and every time we have to go for uh, a, a product certification under 62443 or under one of the ISO 27,000Xs or even the 9000 series. Um, or if you're under a, a NIST framework guidance for either the security framework itself, uh, the risk framework, or whether you're actually trying to be compliance with eight, in compliance with 853. Um, it, it's really about the industry coming together at the industrial manufacturers level, the, the guys that actually build the equipment, uh, coming together and sharing ideas and thoughts around how to effectively uh, influence and manage that process. And it's not just about security, it's also about operations. On the security yeah. side, mm -hmm. um, well, the organization got together as its first major effort and built a thing called the Reference Architecture, the IIRA, uh, which is the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture that the IIC published uh, over two years ago now, um, which was how do you build a, a foundational industrial platform um, in, in preparation for uh, application to security. And then in the application to security, uh, they created the security working group. And the security working group's first effort was to publish the IISF, which is the inter industrial internet security framework that sits on top of the reference architecture. Now, both of those documents, like all of the compliance objectives, are, are, are tomes, right? I mean, they're, most of them are in excess of 400 pages. So to give an operating engineer, you know, uh, the 62443 documentation or even the IIRA or IISF or both and say, you know, read through this and, and tell me how, what kind of changes we need to make to our proposed installation in order to be compliant 
is a, is a massive undertaking. So one of the things that we're trying to do now with the uh, Security Applicability Contributing Group, which is a subcomponent of the Security Working Group, is to develop guidance documents, best practices documents for all of the six elements that are represented in the security framework. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one that we strapped on was endpoint security best practice, and we should uh, quickly make mention of the fact that an endpoint is described as anything that has a compute capacity and a communications capability. Um, so that covers a, a broad range of things from you know level zero, level one devices, all the way up through gateways, services, ICS SCADA, uh, DCS platforms, um, and potentially all the way out to you know large scale virtualized environments, whether that's uh, on-prem or off-prem or hybrid, um, you know, all part of the industrial ecosystem that, that has to be part of the compliance objectives that, that are going to allow an organization, consuming organization, the manufacturers, customers, to actually achieve compliance or achieve um, audit goals. That make sense? Yeah, it does. Tell, tell me about the uh, endpoint security best practices, because that just came out, issued earlier this month, um, kind of uh, from a high level, um, what's, the, what are the, what, what's the high level on the, the recommendations? You know, if I'm a, a designer or security engineer, what's my takeaway here? Well, again, it's it's not so much the engineer as it is the the prerequisite to the engineer. It's it's somebody who's considering a security design and doesn't want to sit down and spend the next half year reading through uh, the various compliance objective documentations that are out there. Um, you know, it's it's a way to get your arms around the problem set. At least that's what the goal of the paper is, and it will be for the other five areas that are described in the IISF as well, which include network and policy and data protection and a number of different elements in overall cybersecurity for industrial platforms. But what we tried to do with the uh, with the security best practices, the endpoint security best practices, was to take. Uh, the compliance objectives as they exist from both a contributory perspective as well as from a compliance perspective. So there's aspects of 62443, 3-3, as well as NIST 853-R4, but there's also guidance coming in from things like BSSL and Industry 4.0. Um, there's even overlap into things like NERC SIP, where, again, we've taken the, the, the idea of what is a secure endpoint. We've tried to coalesce that into something uh, far smaller than 400 pages. I, I, the current paper is 13 pages, so it's it's easily consumable in a night's reading. And then we give you the the links back in the various elements to what the regulatory compliance objectives or audit compliance objectives are in those bigger documents. So getting your arms around the fact that you need to somehow classify the risk to your platform, you have to classify that in terms of what type of attacker. Uh, may be causing uh, you to have consternation uh, for that risk, and then determining the types and, and, and values of the control objectives that you need to apply to that environment in order to achieve a level of compliance. And we decided to take a combination of both the 853 R4, soon to be R5, uh, FISMA low, medium, and high approach, as well as the 62443, which is actually a five-level document, zero and one, levels are pretty much no security. Uh, starting with level two, there is discernible security against the style of attacker and then going up to level three and level four. So we consolidated those into the three basic categories of basic, enhanced, and critical. And then, you know, hopefully that's going to help organizations get their arms around what is their asset class and what types of controls might they have to consider at those levels. That makes sense? Yeah, terrific. So what I'm hearing is, you know, the uh, if you're looking at deploying endpoint security and you want to be compliant, uh, this best practices will help you to become compliant, um, and uh, for the different security levels, I think what leaps out to me is, you know, when when you think about trying to implement this security with open source, you've got to stitch together all sorts of different technologies on your own, and if you have the crypto 
capabilities in-house to do that and move beyond just an SSL implementation, but to you know, integrate it with a, it could be a TPM chip or some sort of hardware secure element or leverage uh, a, a real, you know, implement true PKI uh, or other um, uh, secure network uh, transport options. Um, it can be pretty complicated and risky. Not only could be, is <laughs> very complicated, which was the purpose of the paper. And it, it's really not designed to, to help people become compliant. It's to help people get their arms around what compliance means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, at a basic level with the, with the uh, as an example, 62443-3 defined risk category of a, uh, a moderately provisioned attacker uh, without extreme resources gaining access to an element. And that's right. the risk against which you are uh, building a compliance framework that then gets you to 62443-3-3 level 2, as an example. Um, right. And that would be considered a basic security platform. When you think about all the pieces, if you're going to do that with an open source uh, commodity, or it's actually going to be multiple open source commodities, um, because you're going to have to have some root of trust, whether that's an embedded certificate or whether that's a software-based root of trust or even if that's a bridge into a firmware-based root of trust, which is actually level three, you know, those those interfaces have to be developed, they have to be managed, and if you're using FIPS libraries, in many cases, they have to be adapted to the platform that they're being applied to. And then going up the stack, and when you start talking about, you know, strong authentication using, you know, an X509 certificate, an embedded PKI, or other additional factors <laughs> of authentication, all of that coming together is a lot of work. I mean, it's just yeah, pure and sure simple, is. a lot of work in the open source community. And there are commercial alternatives to that, such as Mokana. Right. So let's talk a little bit about that, because part of this comes down to the economics of this, right? It's, it's about, uh, and this is just kind of a model, a way to think about it. But, you know, looking at training your employees, handling the software development in-house, and then also managing the life cycle of security. You know, these are based on estimations from some of our customers in some instances. But the reality is that when you look at the support costs, sometimes developing and having to figure out how to have a monitoring and patch team, as well as um, uh, continuing, continually maintaining the changes, uh, can be very difficult especially if you've stitched all of the pieces together. So part of what uh, I think, you know, a lot of the challenges that you went through with regard to compliance as well as simply supporting um, uh, uh, various uh, technologies as well as the vulnerabilities um, can, be, uh, can be costly, more costly than, than people think, I believe. So um, I, I'm going to dive into, uh, you know, uh, a couple of things here. I'm just jumping ahead here um, and then open it up for questions. But when you think about all of the different aspects of security that you'd want to integrate in, um, what Mokana does and how we help customers is uh, by creating a, a single platform to manage the life cycle of security end-to-end with uh, software that can sit on the endpoint, tools to help manage uh, security on devices. And um, it's everything that uh, is not, you know, kind of network perimeter defenses or uh, threat detection and, and monitoring or policies and procedures. This is all about strong endpoint security and a full integrated solution that helps companies to migrate away from a patchwork of various technologies into a consolidated system. And this is why we help uh, companies that are, are large global OEMs, uh, like a GE, Emerson, Bosch, uh, Siemens, et cetera, uh, to really think about building strong security, uh, or not to think about, to build strong security into, uh, into devices of all kinds. 
um, whether it's on a on a, a an airplane, uh, an industrial manufacturing plant, a uh, processing plant, um, or, or in uh, transportation, automotive, or medical. So. Um, with that, I will, uh, I'll open it up to qu for questions. If, uh, if you have questions out there, please enter it into the chat. Uh, if you have questions around compliance, uh, open source, or Mokana, uh, we'd love to hear from you. OK, so we have uh, one here, Dean, in, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, just uh, changes in uh, the question is um, uh, what changes do you see coming up in uh, industrial controls systems and uh, IEC 62443 well you know so the ISI 99 contributing group to the IEC ISO uh, standards that are the 62443 objectives um, that that's getting uh, broader, right? I mean, it's it's trying to take into consideration more aspects of the industrial community um, for areas that were not traditionally just the elements themselves. So again, branching out into um, the the SCADA system security, the uh, element protection of the data that is being generated, et cetera, et cetera, and and you know that's in in the aspect of six two four four three in the in the broader scheme. You know, we've, we've seen um, renewed interest. I mean, one of the things that uh, President Trump uh, signed as executive order last year was a, a line item element that said, do a better job of, of achieving um, FIPS 140-2 certification and the validation use of that in uh, all process, not specifically IT, not specifically OT, but all process. So we're also seeing some more government and regulatory um, pressures on industry to become more compliant. I mean, I, I think everybody knows that you know our, our electrical grid, as an example, is at risk today. And while we have you know some capacity for resilience, you know we're starting to to, to what we've <laughs> those of us in the security industry have yelled about for years. But uh, the the operating engineering teams are actually starting to see directed attacks against their safety and reliability systems, which is causing a, a considerable amount of, of consternation um, because they have always relied on those systems as backup. So you're, you're kind of in a perfect storm environment where the risks are continuing to increase, the attackers are getting more knowledgeable about the industrial components, and at the same time, the renewed government uh, interest on behalf of the public is uh, is going to push regulatory compliance with these types of elements down into the operators, which will then force that back into the manufacturers as as things that they need to see in their products. That's what Excellent. Second. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dean. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of the webinar, and if you have any questions, please do feel free to follow up with us and, um, uh, and reach out to Makana via the website. Uh, and also, if, you have, uh, if you'd like to download this presentation and also a, uh, a white paper on, uh, on the subject on understanding compliance and support costs, uh, you'll find it on the Bright Talk site, and we'll also be emailing those of you who have attended with the links. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dean, for your time, and uh, uh, have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thanks for listening. Thank you.